Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, it's my first time in Helsinki. I'm really excited. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about onboarding, introducing people to your product, and why it's usually the most important part of your growth strategy. So a little bit about me. Uh, I help companies scale. So as an employee, I led the growth team at Pinterest. I started the marketing team at Grubhub. I was a growth advisor to Greylock Partners, a venture firm in the Valley. And I started my career as an analyst at Apartments.com. And now I work as an advisor uh, to a bunch of different consumer marketplaces, network-driven businesses, uh, places like Eventbrite, Thumbtack, Reddit, uh, to help them successfully scale their businesses. So what we're going to get into today is why focus on onboarding? Why do I think this thing is so important? Uh, two, how you should think about optimizing your onboarding some stories of how I worked on this problem at Grubhub and Pinterest, and then how you should think about the, the process of using qualitative and quantitative data to help your business in this area. So to get started, why onboarding? Why is this thing so important? If you've ever done a cohort graph, how many people have actually done a cohort analysis for your business? OK, some of you. Uh, I'll, I'll show one later in the presentation. This is where you watch people kind of try your product, and you see how many people continue to use it over time. And inevitably, in most businesses, you see the most people drop out at the beginning. They try the product once, and they never come back. And then hopefully, if you have a good product, some people stay for the long term and build a habit. So if you fix onboarding, or if you improve it, it actually is the biggest driver of your long term retention in most businesses. But not only that, indirectly, onboarding is the biggest driver of acquisition as well. Most of the most scalable strategies for acquiring new users have to do with retained users bringing other users into the product. Either they tell other people and, and the product goes viral, or they create content that then you can distribute to a bunch of other people, or they just make you a lot of money, which you can reinvest in you know, sales or marketing. So not only is onboarding usually the biggest driver of retention, indirectly it's the biggest driver of acquisition as well. And a couple things happen when you underinvest in onboarding new users. One is that people come in and they're just confused. Uh, they're trying to figure out the value of this product, and you're not teaching them how to get the value, meaning you know, they churn and then they don't tell other people. But what happens that's even worse is if you're not focusing on your new users, typically as product managers, designers, et cetera, you're then going to be focusing on your existing users who have somehow figured out how to get value out of this product, even though it's hard to understand. And then they're going to want more complex features. They're going to want you to build new functionality, which then makes the product even harder to comprehend for the new users coming in. So not only do you get kind of a first time bad user experience for most people, but the people who get through that end up indirectly making it worse for everyone else. So the first thing you should think about if you're trying to improve your onboarding is you know, what's kind of the metric I should be measuring? So the, the first step of figuring out that metric is what's the key action in your product that most correlates to someone receiving value from it? And how often would you expect someone to want to receive that value, which I call the designated frequency? And for Pinterest, it took some work to figure out the answers to these questions. So for Pinterest, you can scroll through a lot of images. You can... Um, click on images and go to where the content came from, or you can save things for later by creating a board. And what we found as we did research is you could be scrolling through a lot of content because you have a lot of high intent, but it doesn't mean we're actually showing things you want to see. And you can click on content, and that may make us think it's good, but I'm sure we've all had the experience with clickbait where you click on something and it overpromises and underdelivers. So saving something that Pinterest showed you ended up being the best key action. That means Pinterest recommended something, you liked it enough to want to see it again later. To figure out the designated frequency, a, a trick I like to use is just thinking about before your product existed, how did people try to solve this problem? So for Pinterest, where did people go to try to find inspirations on topics they cared about? They bought magazines. And most people got magazines on a monthly or weekly subscription. So our original designated frequency target was monthly, and then we later changed it to weekly. For Grubhub, this problem was a lot simpler. There's only one thing you can do with Grubhub, and that's order food, 
have it come and have it be delicious. So the key action was very easy for us. It was how many people ordered food online. And then, of course, people ordered food before Grubhub existed. They just used their phone to call the restaurant. So we asked these people, how often do they order food on Grubhub? Uh, and they would say once or twice a month. So our designated frequency target for Grubhub was also monthly. So if you have these two data points, then you can build a cohort analysis. And on the y-axis of this graph is the key action, the percentage of people that are doing it over time. And then on the x-axis is your designated frequency. And if your business has product market fit, you will see a flattening of this curve. A bunch of people in the darker blue will drop out. They will churn. And then some people, hopefully, will stick with the product and build a habit. So the point at which you stop losing users out of your cohort is what we call the habit moment. And the way you measure that is the habit metric. How long does it take, and what are the actions people need to do to get to that habit? So it's finding not only the key action and the designated frequency, but what's that retention interval at which you can say, if they're doing it this week, they're going to do it next week. Or if they're doing it this month, they're going to do it next month. But people don't get to the habit of using a product immediately, right? It takes time. So you have to work your way backward from, OK, these people who got the habit, how did they get here? And the, the two uh, pieces that you need to figure out are the aha moment and the setup moment. The aha moment is the first time someone experiences that value, where they really get it and they appreciate the product that you're building. And the setup moment is the work that both the user and you as the company need to do to make sure people can reliably get to that aha moment. And I'll walk through a bunch of examples soon. But first, who should actually work on this problem? Who, what's an onboarding team look like? Uh, this is not a marketing problem. This is not just a sales problem. This is a cross-functional team, product designers, engineers, product managers. If it's B2B, a lot of times sales will be involved. Sometimes marketing will be involved, user research. All these people have to be working together to figure out how to build the right experience so that people are going to get the value of your product and keep using it. Which begs the question, where does onboarding end and the core product experience begin? And the argument I would make is that your onboarding team should be in charge of the entire product experience until people reach the habit moment, which is a bit scary at first. But when we switch to this uh, mantra of working for our onboarding team at Pinterest, we were able to have a lot larger gains in retention as a result. OK, so let's actually get to improving your onboarding. How do you do it? Well, it requires both people and metrics. You have to look at your data, and you have to talk to users. So you know, here's some examples from Grubhub. This is a graph that I pulled of the number of online ordering restaurants on the x-axis when you typed in your address. And on the y-axis, your conversion rate to purchase. And what we noticed in almost every city we launched in is at a certain point, there's this step change where the conversion rate doubles. And this is the city of Boston, and the conversion rate doubles at around 55 restaurants. So when we saw this, we were like, OK, it's very clear if we can get to a certain density of restaurants, then people are much more likely to activate. They're much more likely to retain. So then the next question became, where are all the areas where we're not reliably getting people to these number of restaurants so that we can focus our sales efforts on making sure that everyone who, who searches in Boston, for example, is going to get at least 55 restaurants? And doing this helped us increase our retention dramatically. So this is an example of looking at the data, but then we also talk to users. And when we talk to users, we say, oh, why, why didn't you keep using Grubhub, or why aren't you using it more often? And they would say, oh, it's expensive. And we'd be like, OK, well, that's weird. We don't actually charge you. We charge the restaurant. But what they meant is that restaurants had high delivery minimums and fees in some cases, which meant you'd have to spend a little bit more than you wanted to uh, to enjoy a meal, which meant that you weren't going to do it that often or you weren't going to do it again. So what we did is we took this information, and uh, we went back to our restaurants, and we said, hey, we think there's a lot of latent demand to order more often that you're missing because of your minimums and fees. Why don't you try dropping those? And we expect to see that there will be an increase in volume that will more than make up uh, for the loss in margin on a poor order basis. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the restaurant industry, restaurant industry is normally a very low margin business. Um, but that is primarily driven by the front of the house. You just can't pack more people into a place. Those slushes 
testing that today. Um, but they usually can always make more food in the kitchen. So they can always pump more food out for delivery. So delivery ends up being the highest margin business that a restaurant usually has. So we convinced this random Costa Rican restaurant to try us. They dropped their minimum, and they immediately jumped to the number one restaurant in Chicago, which was one of our most popular markets. And then we were able to build a case study around that to showcase to a bunch of other, our other restaurants to try this, and we were able to systematically lower minimums and fees as a result. So how do you think about the setup moment and the aha moment for Grubhub? So if you go to Grubhub, pretty much every screen will have something like this at the top. Where are you? Give us your physical address. And this is a pretty big ask for someone who's just coming to your website for the first time. But restaurant delivery boundaries are not based on the city or based on the zip code or the neighborhood. They're based on the street. So we need to actually know your address to reliably show you good results. So even though it's the big ask, we make the user give us this information. But then, of course, that alone isn't going to get you to the aha moment. We then need to make sure we have a plethora of great online ordering results for you uh, for every single address. So in this case, this is my address. Don't write it down. Um, but we have plenty of restaurants that deliver, so the chances of me finding something and building a habit are very high. For Pinterest, this is what the uh, landing screen for a new user looked like when we started working on onboarding. We're asking people to find friends. We're asking people um, to invite friends. There's all these images. Some are picked for you based on your activity. Some are based on a topic you follow. Some are based on friends that you follow. People were so confused. Um, so as we looked at the data, we saw that the people who got through this experience successfully found something they liked enough to save it. Uh, and when we started doing the user research, especially internationally, we were finding that pretty much every piece of content we were recommending was in English. And people would say, look, I can speak English. I can read English. I don't want to. I want to, I want to read in my local language. Um, so we went to work on changing a lot of these, emphasizing repinning, emphasizing you know, local content. And here are some specific examples. So on Android, where most people internationally were signing up, we radically simplified the sign-up process to get you to the aha moment faster. So we started pre-populating your email address and your name. We started removing password as a requirement. And then age and gender are skippable. So then we can immediately get you into the core. But then we would stop you and ask you to pick five topics, because we need to know what you're interested in in order to show you a great feed. So eliminated a lot of the extraneous steps but forced topic uh, uh, picking, because that is the real setup moment. And then when you got into that feed for the first time, we used to show all this information about the piece of content, who pinned it, where the image came from, what the description was. And people didn't know what any of that stuff meant, and they weren't interested in it. So on the right, we switched to a, an experience where we're just showing more imagery and less textual content which means more content on the page to browse at the same time, more likely to find something you like, more likely to repin, more likely to retain. We also started adding more user education. And you know, there's, a design that, there's a design philosophy that's common in the Valley that says, if a design needs education, it's a bad design. My response to this is a design with education is better than a design that doesn't educate. If your user needs to know what to do, and you know, education can help them figure out how to get value, do not be afraid to do that. So in this particular example, you can see on the left, you land on the feed for the first time, and we just ask you to scroll to see more. When you stop scrolling, that education changes to say, you know, tap any pin for a closer look. And when you get to an actual image, uh, under, over the Save button, there's this pulsing icon drawing your eye to that, saying, hey, here's the key thing you need to learn on this page. And when you click on it, it explains the value of saving. And all of this work increased activation rate dramatically, essentially doubling activation rate over time uh, for Pinterest. So one of the things that you should think about for your business is how fast do you need to get people to that aha moment? Like, How important is time to value? So for something where there's a lot of intent, like doing your taxes, if you don't do them, you will go to jail. 
people are going to go through a lot of work to make sure they get the value done, which is completing their taxes, right? So the onboarding process can be fairly complex, it can be fairly long, people are going to figure it out. But for Pinterest, Pinterest is almost on the entirely opposite end of this spectrum. Most people are signing up, they've heard about it, but they don't know exactly what value they're going to get, they don't know if it's really for them, so we had to make the time to value really short. Get them into the product value as soon as you can, otherwise they will bail, they'll do something else. And for Grubhub, while the intent is high, you hung you're hungry, you want to order food, there's also a bunch of alternatives to using Grubhub, right? You can go to the pantry and eat some chips, you can go cook something, or you can walk outside and find something to eat. So if we, weren't, if we didn't have delicious food on its way to you in five minutes or less, chances are you were going to find something else. So Grubhub was also on the left side of this spectrum. But for a lot of B2B businesses, the intent is so high that your onboarding can take weeks or months and people are still going to deal with it. And that's OK. You just need to figure out where you need to be on the spectrum. OK. So thinking through the quantitative steps to improving your onboarding. The first is you have to define the actions that activated users and churn users are taking. What are the people who activate in your product doing that churn users aren't? And are there things churn users are doing that are making them not successful? And inevitably, the first time you do this analysis, uh, the answer is anything. People who do anything are way more likely to retain than people who don't do anything, which of course is not very helpful information. But it points to this piece where all you can get from this analysis is correlation, and you need to test, is this a survivorship bias? Of course, the people who pinned 100 pins in the first day are more likely to retain. That doesn't mean I can get everyone to do that. Or is it an actual insight that can help improve your onboarding? So the only way to do that is to take the short list of things that correlate to people who retain and then start emphasizing that in your onboarding, seeing if you can get more people to do it. And if you can get more of those people to do it, does your activation rate increase? Does your retention rate increase for the business? On the qualitative side, you need to talk to users, both the people who churn from the product as well as the people who are successful. What are the people who are successful finding as the value of the product? And how is that different from the people who churn? Are the people who churn not understanding that value? Or are they just not a good fit for that value and need to change your marketing habits to reach the right people? And that's great for understanding the value of the product that you're building. But in order to understand your actual onboarding flow, these people aren't going to remember a lot of it. They're not going to be able to give you great insights. So to get that, you have to watch new users run through the product. You have to you know, see what they're doing, see if they're understanding, ask them questions, put a laptop in front of them, put it, make them download the app, whatever, and just watch them use it. So we touched a bit on this uh, earlier, but user research needs to be involved in every step of the way. You just can't systematically improve your onboarding only looking at the data. And I've seen a lot of teams you know, forget to really involve user research as much as they can. At Pinterest, we essentially made them part of our cross-functional team. So if you're thinking about, OK, I want to go back and improve my onboarding, what do I do? This question of, do you overhaul your entire experience, or you know, do you start optimizing? And that question really depends on the stage of your company. The earlier stage you are, the more likely you're just going to try something totally different, and the confidence in what you're currently doing. If your onboarding flow is working, then you're going to start optimizing it by isolating variables and seeing if that's improving retention. But if you're not confident if it's working, or if you're hitting a local maxima, then that's where you might want to try something radically different and A-B test it against what you've been doing and see what that difference looks like. OK, so this is just a sample of some of the stuff I've learned on onboarding. I've actually worked to build an eight-week course on retention and engagement at reforge.com with Brian Balfour, Sean Klaus, and Andrew Chen. So if you're looking to get more into this topic, you know, feel free to come to Reforge and uh, sign up for the next class. And uh, thanks so much for having me.